Um, so, so to start, to start, one of the key concepts of our system is, is that it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, and this, this is fundamental to how we operate. So typically, how traffic comes into our system, it's a, it's a HTTP S3 request coming in from an application. It usually goes through a load balancer that then can distribute to any node in the cluster. So that's important because what one of, one of the um, ways things that's very important is that we could start very small. So you could start with a very small cluster, say two nodes, three nodes, and then you could then start adding on the fly when in production you add capacity to the system. We'll show a short demo of how we do that. And then also, it doesn't require that all the nodes are the same. We run on commodity software, commodity hardware, I mean, and the hardware is constantly moving, <coughs> getting better, getting cheaper. So we, we're future-proofed to add in new, new hardware that we could ingest and take advantage of efficiently. Can I ask uh, you a quick question there? Yeah. You've drawn it as a ring. Is there any reason why you've specifically shown it as a ring? Well, <coughs> we'll talk about how we do this, but, but how we initially distribute the data is based on a consistent hashing mechanism where we take a hash of the bucket plus object key to get a token, and then we then decide on the distribution of the data. Okay, the other reason I ask that is obviously that is quite, I think, quite important for people when they're trying to understand your architecture. Right. And if, it, and if that is relevant, yeah, great. <coughs> it's good to talk about it, but... Um, Right. Uh, if it's not and it's all just like a mesh, I guess it's also it's, good to... It's actually more accurate as a mesh. It's just right. a lot harder to, to show on I know. slide. That's why yeah. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm asking point, the question. Yeah. So Everything's point to point. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. So, so the way to view it is like the initial view, it's easy to think of as a ring for the initial decision, but then yeah. underneath, there's almost a mesh of peer-to-peer -peer traffic going on. Right. Yeah, one, one, one of the key, key points of, of what we have done here is that you know, any data object is going to be at most mic. You're going to get the mic right here. Yeah, so, so one, one of the sort of key things here, uh, the way that we, we have architected that is that not, not only can you start small, but, but also even when you go to like a thousand nodes, um, the, the data object that you're looking for is always no more than one hop away. It's so, so at most, you, you will go to one more node. And, and that's a very key part of this architecture. So then that would allow it to scale you know, with, without, without yeah. you know, limits. Not clear from that diagram. Exactly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so it's mo no more than one hop away from a peer-to-peer -peer relationship perspective. It, is latency factored into that at all? So if it's the underlay is you know five hops away from a network perspective. That's really good. That's a great right. question. So we call that dynamic snitch. So each each peer, each node, maintains dynamically an ordering of the other peers in terms of response time, and will prefer will actually go right in order and prefer to read back data from the closest peer closest in terms of latency. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a key point again because we, we faced a decision very <coughs> early on that do we u use the rack and data center in information that we have? So we, we, we know, you know every node what rack they're on, what data center they're on. Do we u use that a, as our, our sort of definition of in, in the closeness or do we use a more dynamic way, right? So we, we decided to you know, do it in a more dynamic way. Because even if something m that might be one data center away, if you have a very high speed connection, versus a local node that may be really busy, that one that's a little further away may, may actually be closer. You know, that's maybe where you want to send, the no send, send your traffic. Right, right, but you still need to use physical locality mm -hmm. to define failure. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so we, we, right. we only so, use So the failure means your performance domains are independent. Exactly yeah, right, that's okay. right, you're right. Perfect. That's right. That's right. Or they're separate decision parts. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this diagram, a couple other things I want to point out. So one is, is it has multiple data centers. So, so we take into account the data center for um, the uh, failure domains, the protection policies, and we'll see how we apply the per data center policies. And then um, a key point about a peer-to-peer -peer system, all the software is installed on all the nodes. All this, any node can receive any request. So that makes it easy for us to add nodes and remove nodes. So so when we add a node, it's automatically incorporated into the cluster. There's some data movement that'll occur for the consistent hashing. So, so the new node um, has the data it needs 
um, according to the distribution algorithm. So I think next we'll show a demo of how we do that cluster expansion. This demonstration is going to show how we expand the life <coughs> of the hyperstore system by adding a node. We have two load generator <coughs> tools running. Uh, one's doing git and one's doing puts. And you can monitor the results here. All the requests are going through successfully. And the average throughput is shown there. From the Cloudian Management Console, we can add the new node. Um, well, first, this is a three node cluster, and we're going to add the fourth node next. We, the put and get statistics are shown there because we are receiving some load right now. From node management, add uninstall node, we'll enter the node credentials for node four with host name, IP address, and root password. Um, Puppet will be ran on all of the nodes, and the configuration files will be updated that way. And also the software packages, the RPMs, will be installed on the new node, and Puppet will configure that node also. Is the Puppet licensing required as part of this? Yeah. Or we have to already be licensed for Puppet, or using some free elements? We use the open source, open source. version of the Puppet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So now the command was sent, and Puppet's working on all of the nodes, and the RPMs are being installed. And load from our load tools are still showing successful requests. And all of the add node output is displayed here in CMC. Then a few minutes later, you'll see the new node added in the management console, all while receiving load. This concludes our demonstration of adding the node. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the same message, programmatic API. So that add node, it's, it's triggered. You could trigger it via CMC, but you could also trigger it via API call. So the, uh, the NTT cluster, how many node configuration was that 2.3 million user? We, we're, we're not allowed to tell you that. <laughs> Can't tell us how many cluster nodes there were? OK. Yeah, but it's a. Is it nearest order of magnitude? Is it seven? <laughs> <laughs> Two. Come on, help us out. A lot more. Than seven. More than seven, less than four million. <laughs> okay, let's narrow it down a little. <laughs> what about the Nifty configuration? Can you tell us how many cluster nodes that was? Um, I, I can tell you that it's you know, more, more than one data center. We, we, we specifically asked them for sort of permission to disclose like sizes and stuff because a lot of people ask these questions. But unfortunately, they, they, they hold it pretty close to their chest. So it reminds we, me when I worked on that. Wall Street and what company we bought patch cables from was considered competitive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, you can't tell anybody anything. <laughs> but can you share a sense of, hey, when the customers buy this sort of proprietary or commodity hardware, and with this much capacity, they typically store this much from an object count perspective in, in the case of replicas, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's a little bit really sort of all over the place. So, so the, you know, the NTT East one, the, the sort of 2.3 million user one, that one is predominantly pictures. You know, mm -hmm. photographs, right? So, so the the you know, object sizes on average are sort of megabyte level. Um, you know, the Nifty one is really all over the place. It's they they got a bunch of stuff that's like 1K, and they got a bunch of stuff that's like hundreds of gigabytes uh, each. So, um, yeah, we we um, just you know, just to give you a sense for the size of some of these clusters, uh, one of the reasons why um, we we actually will will be talking about smart smart support is that. Um, it became very quickly obvious to us that we're, we're not able to sort of analyze the logs without having some big data analysis, right? So we, we um, pull, pull logs, we analyze the logs, we try to predict problems, but the logs are such volume that we, we have to do them, you know, we have to do the analysis so that as they're coming in. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <coughs> okay. I, um, so I can you tell us what the maximum cluster configuration that's been deployed so far? It's it's on on the order of sort of hundreds of nodes. Hundreds of nodes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to uh, walk through a the life cycle of an S three. Uh, oh. The minimum okay. cluster from a configuration perspective is uh, one. Is a one node yeah. system. One, one node, node system. So running on your laptop. 
Yeah. So well, that, that's only for, that's only for test purposes. It, it's, no. it's, it's, it's only for <laughs> testing. So 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 the smallest production systems that we've had is like so two nodes. Okay. So and we'll, then you we'll know people go Chris's from there. Raspberry Pi cluster. Yeah. <laughs> so we could have done a demo. We'll we could have just had yes. everyone running it today. Oh. We could have just we could have run it all on our machines sitting but it, here. But as, as part of our, part of our a good activity. But part yeah. of our testing. I mean, this is really important in terms of cluster scale, right? How how wide can you scale? So part of our testing that we put every release through is a 200 node test. Um, we don't have 200 nodes. We actually use Amazon. We basically do do our instance there. We basically procure the 200 nodes. We run our full 200 node test, and then we also do a very big object scaling per bucket. So we basically do a, 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 a billion objects in a bucket, right? So what we really want to do is scale, right? And so we do a billion objects in a bucket. We do a 200 node test. Every one of our releases goes through that to make sure that we're able to scale to the level that our customers need. Right? So and and really I think to add that uh, one of the cool things that we see um, because of this architecture is when you're going to <laughs> billions. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. when you're scaling actually to the billions, so when we do a test, we actually monitor latency. And uh, we are actually very proud to see when you are actually testing hundreds of nodes or billions of objects, our latency actually remains constant because of that one hop, um, like, you know, architecture. Because, like, you know, I've come from EMC and big scale-out scale uh, boxes where latencies can actually drop after, like, you know, 30, 40 nodes, right? So, uh, so it's very, very, like, you know, interesting to see that even with billions of objects, hundreds of nodes, our latency remains, like, a literally flat line, uh, irrespective of, like, you know, how big the system is. So, and you showed us a demo of adding new nodes to the cluster. I mean, that's great. We get that. That's simple, pretty straightforward. Yep. What about, hey, one of your nodes dies for whatever reason, yep. the re-ingestion of information into the replacement node, because it's yep. brand new, essentially. Does it have to assume the identity of a previous node? No, no. So, so there's two, two scenarios. So one is a temporary, and one is a permanent. So the temporary is much more common, right? You have some network glitch. You lose your, both your network cards or your motherboard. So in that case, the system automatically uh, adapts to it, says, uh, and then the operator says, you know, OK, I'm just going to wait until I bring that same node back up. It comes back up. Most of the data is probably still accurate, and then and then we'll automatically run a repair process that's that does a Merkle tree comparison of what data is on, what data should belong there, and repair the minimum set of data there by streaming across from multiple. So that's that's a temporary case. Um, in the permanent case, you might have a scenario where at the node level or even at the disk level, you permanently want to replace it. Mm -hmm. So that, that also we, we, we have a procedure for that's, that's automated. And in that case, you have to, what we call decommission the old nodes so, and then add a new node. So that's how, that's how that process works. And, and decommission is an API, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And you don't necessarily need to add... Because it's a word that implies right. a lot more than you want it to. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. So you don't need right. to add a new node a, a, as well. So the other thing you can do is just decide that you actually want to redistribute it across the existing Oh, cluster. right. So if, I have, mm -hmm. if, I have if you space. want to permanently take it out, you decommission, then stop. Good. And, mm -hmm. and, and you'll see a little later on in terms of what we do in terms of vNodes. That's how we manage to, to keep it to the isolated thing that's failed. And we, can only, we only have to then recover those failed objects. And so it's something that we put in that makes it pretty smart. Right. And are you from seeing a management perspective, <laughs> from, a man <laughs> from the management perspective, I think the goal and, and uh, um, the, pro the product provides is you don't have to run to the system when something fails. Like, you know, traditionally we know how RAID works. But when a drive fails, you can just, like, you know, uh, the uh, system will automatically distribute data. So the Google or Facebook classic case is once a month ago, a guy goes with all the drives and the nodes, and he just yanks out the drives and he plugs it in. So that's the model that we are, like, you know, uh, f following as well. So mm -hmm. if it fails, your system will always be up and running. As long as you have enough capacity, it will distribute the data, and you can just go once a month and replace all the drives, and it will tell you, and you just yank it out, plug it back in, and press a button, and it will just consume it back. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing scenarios where, uh, in your early adoption of someone lo looking at this initially, right. they'll deploy it as a single node and then have the replica being out on S3, therefore they don't have to have extra <coughs> capital being consumed internally, and then they can scale up their nodes internally and continue to use S3 as that repository yeah. for a replica. Why don't you talk to that, Paul? I mean, actually, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. The question <laughs> really comes down to is, are people leveraging S3 as their secondary replica until they scale out their internal node 
deployments. Amazon S3, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, are, yeah. are they using the hybrid side of things? Um, we actually use, <coughs> we see the hybrid thing actually coming in later. So most people are actually deploying, they, they like directionally where they want to go to get to Amazon. A lot of enterprises, there's a ton of people using Amazon, but an awful lot of them are tech companies and specialist tech companies and, and the big enterprise stuff, that movement I think is still to happen. Sure. And so uh, most deployments we're seeing, people are deploying a private cloud, completely Amazon compatible, so that at any point in time they can actually manage and, and tier, and they'll do initially just some of the tiering of objects. Hmm. So, so that's how we're seeing most deployments okay. today. Cool. All right, let, um, let's talk about what we mean by um, one hop, what we mean by distribution of the data, um, where we apply the policies, etc. So this is um, one S3 put. So I'm going to write an object to the cluster. <coughs> so the request comes in from the client or the client application. Say it's a photo sharing site or something. You're posting a photo. Runs to a load balancer. Gets distributed to this node here. So <coughs> this this node then for that request is is marked as the coordinator node. So at the coordinator node, we, we apply, start applying the policy. So we say, OK, for, for this particular bucket, it's configured to put two replicas in DC1, one replica in DC2. So we've made several policy decisions here. At, uh, wait. No, I don't have that. I'll, I'll show you that slide um, going forward. But, but we've made several decisions. First, we've decided to use replicas instead of storing that object in Cassandra or erasure coding. We've decided how many replicas we want in each data center, at all, all locally here first. Then we're going to uh, make a call out to Cassandra to compute a token. So based on the object key, we'll, we'll map that into a, a number, a, a number, a, a, a token um, that's from 0 to 2 to the 127th minus 1. And that token then is used by Cassandra to decide where in this token ring, this consistent hashing ring, that node, the, the primary replica of that node in that data center um, should go. And besides that then, Cassandra is going to compute other replicas based on different characteristics of, of information and provide back an ordered list of, OK, back here, at the S3 proxy, now we, we know these are the, these are the three nodes that we, sh we want to store the data in. So in parallel, we're going to send out those requests. We want to write this object out to those nodes. And then, and then we'll wait for responses back before responding to the client. So we're at step three. Those requests goes out. At so, each so response back is just an act, right? Just saying yes. Yes, I yeah. got that, and it's been yeah, written. yeah. We use HTTP, so it's in two hundred. Okay. Okay. Why in step three is the node a data node when in other steps it's a data node? Data versus I, coordinator. I'm copy editing again, Dave. It's <laughs> data node in step three, but it's a so the data uh, node. Well, is or it, or it's meant they're not differently they're, here. It's, it, it's, the data node is the one that stores the data. For that request, it's the data node. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's a good, it, they're, they're not different nodes. I mean, it is peer to peer. So while we're calling it a data node, it's only, it's only a term. In, in this context of this write, that's actually a data node where I'm going to be placing data versus the coordinator <sighs> node. But it's. Uh, guys, it's, right, so each of the guys, nodes Dave, is a data Dave node. Dave is just commenting on the fact that sometimes there are quotes and sometimes there aren't. Well, the, 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 the quotes they're making oh, sound like you're using it differently than it is. <laughs> Sorry, the data that's my fault. <laughs> oh, and, and sometimes, sometimes you're doing that because I mean. So let me let me right. let me say, state it back to see if I get my yeah. my understanding. Each one of those nodes and the ring in that diagram is a data node. Yes. Yeah. And one will be marked as a co whichever one yeah. accepts the request becomes the coordinator temporarily for that particular request. Yeah. And then it will redistribute yes. or whatever. So yes. every any node can take on the role of coordinator, coordinator. to handle the particular yes. request. Yeah. And they're all they're all taking on the role of data yes. So Absolutely. node sixteen, if it yeah. becomes the coordinator, might also use itself as yes. one of the data nodes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and that's the preferred uh -huh. scenario because it's a local. Yeah, so you. so when I when I said before that your data is at most one hop away, when when it's not one hop away, it's when when no sixteen happens to have the data there as well. Well, then it's zero hops away. Then then it's zero. Right. 
So you can see the automatic balancing that, that can occur. So first level of balancing is just a load balancer. It could detect you know, which nodes are, have, has the best latency and direct the request to that. And then the second level is that the <coughs> coordinator node via the dynamic snitch could then figure out which nodes um, are responding best. So the, the Cassandra yeah. database is effectively sharded across a number of nodes as well. So it's yes. a possibility that maybe the Cassandra itself when it's computing the object token would require some hops to get the information? No? No, no. So that's a global table. So each it's a global table. Yeah. yeah. So so this is one difference. So so Cassandra has maintains a global understanding of all the other nodes in the system. It it it, it uses a gossip peer-to-peer -peer gossip protocol to exchange health and routing information so between all the nodes. So that particular table is not partitioned across multiple nodes? Exactly not. It's global. It's global and complete. Did I miss the explanation for what the acronym CL stands for? Uh, sorry, that's consistency level. Okay. Mm. I, I did but miss it. That, that's my fault. <laughs> um, so then you'd count that as like having received enough to, to count it as safe, but I might not yet have received right, right. responses from all of right. them. Right. Okay. So, so the easiest um, distinction that's usually made is between eventual consistency and strong consistency. So in the eventual consistency case, you might only wait back for one ACK, and then you respond back to the client and says, okay, you know, that write has succeeded. And then in the background, we'll still work on the other writes. But in, if you want to guarantee strong consistency, that means that when you read after you do a write, you're guaranteed to get back that data. Then you have to wait for a quorum number of nodes to respond. So we support both of those. And by the way, the metadata is written in the <coughs> same way. So we don't have, we don't have a metadata server. Our meta metadata um, server is distributed. It's, it's um, durable and resilient. All right. So um, now let's look at, we talked about um, our peer-to-peer -peer node. What's inside each of these nodes? And that's, that's represented here in this diagram. So we have a bunch of servers running. So, and, and one way to view it is that we have a front end of a bunch of servers that process the requests coming in and then make some decisions. Then we apply our policies as part of our hyperstore engine. And then we can then have the storage um, capability on each of the nodes as well. Each of the nodes ha can store in Cassandra replicas or erasure coding. We have other types of data for authentication, account and QoS information and reports. And then we have our Cloudian Management Console, our CMC out here. It uses no privileged APIs. Everything that's available to this, this tool here can be, is available through the admin API to other applications, management applications we talked about, or OpenStack. We've been integrated to Horizon. <coughs> and applications here just run over HTTP, HTTPS. So there are three classes of data store. Cassandra is used for small objects yep. in a file system yep. manner. Cassandra with replicas. Yeah. And we're waiting to add more. More classes of data stores. Sure. So um, I guess time-wise I'm running behind, but let me just touch on this and we could um, talk about more. But this is looking at our S3 box here. So if we double click on that S3 box, this is actually from a software engineering perspective how we implement it. So we get a request in. It goes through a set of what we call nested handlers. So, so first we'll check authentication and authorization. Then we'll check you know, quality of service, flow control. If, it, if, if this user or this group is sending in too much, we'll, we'll stop it here and short circuit this. Then we'll actually do the S3 processing of all the S3 protocol and decision. And after we do the storage, then we're going to do our accounting. We're going to say, OK, this will transaction log it, we'll count how many bytes were stored, how many objects were stored, et cetera. And the idea here is that it's modular. So these are actually real classes in our code system. 
So that allows us to substitute in and out different handlers and we could even make custom handlers for each specific ones of these if we have specific needs. I want to jump into Cassandra. So, so Cassandra is an open source uh, NoSQL database. Uh, we rely on a lot of the Cassandra features. So behind us we have the whole open source community and the hundreds of Cassandra developers and community working on that and advancing the performance and features of Cassandra. <coughs> It's highly scalable. At last year's uh, Cassandra Summit, um, Apple shocked everyone by saying they have 75,000 nodes of Cassandra running in-house. Um, um, Netflix has, uh, has under, their under their control 2,500 nodes of Cassandra cluster running. Um, it, it support, it's it's, it's um, elastic, so this means it, you could add capacity to a running system and then after that ingest then you want to see a near linear increase in capacity and performance and then it's a shared nothing distributed peer-to-peer -peer architecture so no single point of failure reliability it has um, full data durability um, as as you're writing um, data is synced to disk in an append only fashion um, it's very resilient to network and hardware failures at its core, it has multi-data center features to say, you know, I want to make sure I have this much um, replication in each data center. And then it has tunable data consistency level, eventual versus um, strong consistency. We'll use several of the built-in features of Cassandra underneath. One important one that I'll be talking about is virtual nodes and how that's important. Uh, time to live is expiry. Objects are automatically expired from the system. And it's performance. So the, in particular, the write path is very fast. But of course, Cassandra is not built to be an object store. It was never designed for that. Um, and this talks about some of what we've built on top of Cassandra and extending the features that are needed for an object storage system. <clears throat> so, so um, one of the things is Cassandra's write path, it's very fast because as data is coming in, it's, it's written into RAM and only to an append-only transaction type log for durability. And then only when that RAM area fills up, it flushes that RAM, RAM area to a disk file. So, so this makes it very fast for writes because then once it's written to the transaction log, you're going to respond back to the client. But if you write too much, then you're going to fall behind in this cycle because, because the disk I.O. will fall behind and then you'll, <coughs> you'll be in a, uh, constantly behind. So, so it's not handled for large object writes. Um, the other thing is that Cassandra is a pure repli replication um, engine, right? It just replicates the data. But we want more and multiple data protection policies like erasure coding and so on. And then we want other things like um, ACL, access control, quality of service, tiering, versioning, etc. that we'll build, we've built in. So just, just We've talked about this a bit, but just to review again, so where do we apply different parts of our policy? And at the hyperstore side, we're going to decide, make this decision on the storage, the data protection in terms of Cassandra, replicas, and erasure coding. We're also going to decide on the per DC and per rack level where to store, store how many copies. And at the Cassandra level then, we're going to decide what nodes are alive and how fast are they? And then based on that, then pass back information about where our preference to store. And then as we, return, as we receive the responses back, we're going to decide on the consistency level information. Strong versus uh, eventual consistency and also multi data center consistency. So we might store at the strong consistency in the local data center, but then asynchronously write out to remote data centers. And uh, I want to just touch on one important feature, which is vNodes. So this stands for virtual nodes. 
So because um, because the most common um, area of hardware failure is a disk, we don't want a disk failure to take out our whole node, right? Especially as we get to very dense physical nodes that have so much capacity underneath it. So what we want to do instead is, is allocate a virtual node per disk or a set of virtual nodes per disk. And that allows us a lot of advantages. So, so one of them is that we could then do parallel I.O. across these different vNodes. And then also as we repair and reconstruct data, so say we lose a disk or, or a disk goes bad, then we could do much more parallelization of the, of the repair of that data. And then importantly, we could add heterogeneous machines. So, so different power machines we could assign more V nodes to. And then that allows us that as we get grow our cluster, we could assign different numbers of V nodes to each additional node. So, so this what yeah. determines um, the relationship between V node and physical disk? Because you said one to one sometimes and then you said many to one. So what would um why would you choose one or the other? Right. So right now it's it's a configuration, but our standard way is we just allocate based on the disk capacity of how many, how many V nodes we assign to it. Does that increase your chance for loss of failure by giving you multiple failure domains, essentially? So like if you have multiple V nodes uh, on a single disk and it's spread across to multiple other V nodes on other disks, if a single disk were to fail, you're not going to result in a loss of data or corruption. Yeah, it, it's proportional. So it depends on how many total number of V nodes you have, mm -hmm. right? So, so if you, in the, in the, you know, in the um, one case, you might have one V node per disk. And then say each, each disk is the same size. So that's one case. But if you have four, replace that and you say you have n, n v nodes per disk but everyone has n v nodes then it's functionally equivalent. Is that intended to be used as a kind of aggregator like a, an old school NetApp type aggregation where we are able to get more performance across multiple disks or is it both performant as which in, in, in concert with the ability to have higher resiliency so you can lose multiple V-nodes so and still so have it's actually, no impact. It's a, really, it's a really good point. It's actually a combination of different things. So, so because what we're doing is by slicing it into multiple V-nodes and V-nodes per disk, then we get better parallelization. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can basically do better I.O. to all of the disks. It also is a failure isolation. So whenever I get a disk failure, I take only those V-nodes that have basically failed, and I'll work out, you know, do I want to redistribute the data for those V-nodes or not, or do I do want to just wait and do a disk replacement? So it helps me in terms of failure isolation. And then the other thing, we talked about different size nodes. What it helps us with is it being able to balance, uh, if I bring in, uh, you know, next year, another node into the system, because this is meant to be an internal system. Yeah, so let me if I bring that. in another node and it's going to be double the size, then I can actually allocate more vNodes to it and proportionately it'll get more I.O. So it gives you a kind of data raid. So you can yes. rate protecting it in that form without having to... I mean, I guess if you were to be doing raid within these systems, you have extra levels of resilience, but if you want to maximize it, you stripe everything and then you've got just pure capacity with assuming that the file system is going to be protecting the data that's resides that's right. That's right. That's right. No, so we no want to run with JBODs. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Or, um, and this allows us to do that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is the cases where you go for uh, multiple V nodes per disk? Any chance or actually always? I, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So we we, uh, I mean, um, proportionally, it's about the same. I mean, it 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 just it's just amount of how many total V nodes you want in your whole system, right? So, so. There's a maximum of 256 V nodes per physical node right now. I think, I think in, for example, our 2U appliance, we have, what, 32 uh, V nodes per node, um, or 36. And we is, the, is this a limit, or? This, this is a limit uh, from Cassandra on, oh. on that. So, yeah. so if, if you happen to have more than 256 physical nodes, then, then you know you will have to do something else. You'll have to do like a RAID level or an LVM on top of that to take well, advantage. Two hundred fifty-six physical disks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Disks, yeah. So, so, so uh, <laughs> eff effectively, um, one one of the things we do to automatically allocate these V nodes is we allocate it as as Gary had mentioned by capacity. 
But as we, as we go forward, that's one of the enhancements we want to look at. Do people just want to do it by capacity or possibly by bandwidth possibility off that node? Because I may have faster disks, I may have faster drives, and so there's, there's some other things that we'll look at doing to tune this over time, but today we just do a capacity allocation. We dynamically allocate V nodes based on capacity of the node in terms of... And since your storage solution can reside within a virtual machine, you can grant whatever size physical disk you want to it via VMDKs in the data store, right. therefore you can kind of diminish that while giving a massive amount of capacity. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. It kind of loses part of the value prop of the JBOD approach, but it also gives you the extra level of resiliency in HA, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah, and there's also the speed, right? SSDs mm -hmm. versus SAS versus SATA. Mm -hmm.